Hello readers, we're continuing on with chapter 18 of Sign of the Beaver. If, we, if you remember from the end of chapter 17, there was just kind of a big dark cloud over the friendship between Aten and Matt as we learned about what happened to Aten's um, parents and the fighting and the just the difficult times between Native Americans and white men. Don't forget, this book is taking place um, at the end of the 1700s when colonists were just coming over to settle um, into what we consider the New World and we're finding new land, you know, across the United States and we're taking over land that, you know, belonged to the Native Americans that the white people didn't kind of respect that Native Americans own that land um, and kind of trick them into signing treaties and, you know, using the white men's words. Um, so there's a big distrust between Native Americans and the white men. And unfortunately, it carried over from even, you know, the 13 and the 12 year old of a 10 and Matt. So let's read what happens. Over and over, though he knew the number only too well, Matt counted his notched sticks. He kept hoping he had made a mistake. Always they were the same, ten sticks. That meant that August had long since gone. He couldn't remember exactly how many days belonged to each month, but anyway he reckoned in it the month of September must be almost over. He only needed to look about him. The maple trees circling the clearing flamed scarlet. The birches and aspen glowed yellow, holding a sunlight of their own even on misty days. The woods had become quieter. Jays still screamed at him, and chickadees twit twittered softly in the trees, but the songbirds had disappeared. Twice he had to hear a faraway trumpeting and had seen long straggles of wild geese like trailing smoke high in the air, moving south. In the morning, when he stepped out of the cabin, the frosty air nipped at his nose. The noonday was warm and midsummer, but when he came inside at dusk, he hurried to stir up the fire. There was a chilliness inside him as well, the neither the sun nor the fire even quiet reached. It seemed to him that day by day, the shadows of the forest moved closer to the cabin. Why was his family so late in coming? He was troubled too, because the autumn weather seemed to have brought about a restlessness in a ten. There were days when the Indian boy did not come. He never offered a word of explanation. After a day or two, he would simply walk into the cabin and sit down at the table. He rarely suggested that they hunt or fish together. Day after day, Matt tramped the woods alone, trying to shake the doubts that walked beside him like his own shadow. As he walked, Matt was careful to cut blazes into the bark of trees. They gave him courage to walk further into the forest than he had ever dared before since he was sure of finding his way back to the cabin. He also watched for Indian signs, and sometimes he had sure he had detected one. One day, looking up, he saw in a nearby tree the sign of a turtle. Time to turn back, he told himself. He felt secure now in the territory of the beaver, but he wasn't so certain that the strange people would welcome a white trespasser. As he started to retrace his steps, he heard some distance away the sharp, high-pitched yelp of a dog. It didn't sound threatening, but neither did it sound like it was happy, excited bark of a hound that scented a rabbit. It sounded almost like the scream of a child. When it came again, it died away into a low whining, and he remembered the trapped fox. A ten had warned him to have nothing to do with a turtle trap, but he hesitated, and the sound came again. No matter what a ten had told him, he could not bring himself to walk away from that sound. Warily, he made his way through the brush. It was a dog, a scrawny Indian dog, dirt caked and bloodied. As Matt moved closer, he saw, through the blood, the white streak down the side of the face, then the chewed ear and the stubby porcupine quills. Only one dog in the world looked like that. It was caught by a foreleg, just as the fox had been, and it was frantic with pain and fear. His eyes were glazed and the white foam dripping from his open jaws. Matt felt his own muscles tense with anger. His mind was made up and in an instant. It had been bad enough to leave the fox to suffer. Turtle tribe or no, he was not going to walk away from a ten's dog. Somehow he had to get the dog out of the trap. But how? 
As he bent down, the dog snapped at him so fiercely that he jumped back. Even if it recognized him, a Ten's dog had never learned to trust him. Now it was too crazed to understand that Matt meant to help. Matt set his teeth and stooped again. This time he got his hands on the steel band of the trap and gave it a tug. With a deep growl, the dog snapped at him again. Matt startled, scraped his hand against the steel teeth. He leapt to his feet and stared at the red gash that ran from his knuckles to his wrist. It was no use, he realized. There was no way he could get that trap open with the dog and his maddened state. Somehow, he would have to find a ten. He began to run through the forest, back over the way he'd come, back along the trails he knew, searching his memory for the signs he remembered that led to the Indian village. Luck was with him. There was the sign of the beaver cut into a tree, and here were the fallen legs, logs. He was never brought absolutely sure, but he knew he walked in the right direction. And after nearly an hour, to his great relief, he came out to the shore of the river. There was no canoe waiting, as there had been when a ten had, a ten had led them there. But the river was narrow and placid. Thank goodness he had grown up near an ocean, and his father had taken him swimming from the time he could walk. He left, he left his moccasins hidden under the bush and plunged in. In a few moments, he came out dripping within sight of the stockade. He was greeted by a, a frenzied barking of dogs. They burst through the stockade and rushed towards him, halting only a few feet away, men menacing him so furiously that he dared not take another step. Behind them came a group of girls who quieted the dogs with shrill cries and blows. I have come for a ten, Matt said, when he could make himself heard. The girls stared at him, tired, wet, and ashamed of showing his fear of the dogs. Matt could not summon up any politeness or dignity. A ten, he repeated impatiently. One girl, bolder than the others, answered him, flaunting her knowledge of the white man's language. A ten not here, she told him. Then Sakinus, Sakinus not here, all gone hunt. Desperately, Matt seized his only remaining chance. A ten's grandmother, he demanded. I must see her. The girl looked at each other uneasily. Matt pulled back his shoulders and tried to put into his voice the stern authority that belonged to Saskinus. It is important, he said. Please show me where to find her. Amazingly, he bless, uh, his blustering had an effect. After some whispering, the girls moved back out of his way. Come, the leading girl ordered, and he followed her through the gate. He was not surprised that she led him straight to the most substantial cabin in the clearing. He had recognized on the night of the feast that Saskinus was a chief. Now facing in the doorway was a figure even more impressive than the old man. She was an aging woman, gaunt and wrinkled, but still handsome. Her black braids were edged with white. She stood erect, her lips set in a forbidding line, her eyes brilliant with no hint of welcome. Could he make her understand? Matt wondered. I'm confused. I'm sorry, ma'am, he began. I know you don't want me to come here. I need help. A ten's dog is caught in a trap, a steel trap. I tried to open it, but the dog won't let me near it. The woman stared at him. He could not tell whether she understood a word. He started to speak again when the deerskin curtain was pushed aside and a second figure stood in the doorway. It was a girl with long black braids hanging over her shoulder. She was dressed in blue with broad bands of red and white beading. Strange, Matt thought, how much alike they looked, the old woman and the girl standing side by side and straight and proud. Me, Marie, sister of a ten, the girl said in a soft, low voice. Grandmother, not understand. I tell what you say. Matt repeated what he had said and then waited impatiently while she spoke to her grandmother. The woman listened. Finally, her grim lips parted in a single scornful phrase. Armis Pizwat, she said. Good for nothing, dog. Matt's eyes vanished with anger. Tell her maybe it is good for nothing, he ordered the girl. A ten is fond of it, and it's hurt, hurt bad. We've got to get it out of the trap. There was distress in the girl's eyes as she turned again to her grandmother. He could see that she was pleading, and that in spite of herself, the old woman was relenting. After a few short words, the girl went into the cabin and came back in a moment, holding in her hand a large chunk of meat. A small blanket folded over her arm. Me go with you, she said. Dog know me. In his relief, Matt forgot the torn hand he had been holding behind him. Instantly, the old woman moved forward and snatched at it. Her eyes questioned him. 
It's nothing, he said hastily. I almost got the trap open. She gave his arm a tug, commanding him to follow her. There isn't time, he protested. She silenced him with a string of words in which he understood only the scornful piswat. She say, dog not go away, the girl explained. Better you come. Trap, maybe, make poison. <clears throat> Having no choice, Matt followed them into the cabin. He saw now that the woman's straight posture had been a matter of pride. She was really very lame and stooped as she walked ahead of him. While she, while she uh, busied herself over the fire, he sat obedient on the low platform and looked about him. He was astonished that the little room, strange and so unlike his mother's kitchen, seemed beautiful. It was very clean. The walls were lined and birched and hung with woven mats and baskets of intricate design. The air was sweet with fresh grasses spread on the earth's floor. Without speaking, the woman tended him, washing his hand with clean warm, warm water from a painted gourd. She scooped a pungent smelling paste and spread it over the wound, then bound his hand with a length of clean blue cotton. Thank you, Matt said when she had finished. It feels better. She dismissed him with a grunting imitation of Saskinus good. The girl, who had been watching, moved swiftly to the door. As Matt rose to follow her, the grandmother held out to him a slab of cornbread. He had not realized how hungry he had been, and he accepted it gratefully. The girl took the lead, brushing aside the curious children and the still suspicious dogs. At the river's edge, she untied a small canoe, and Matt stepped into it, thankful that his half-dried clothes would not have to be drenched again. Once on the forest trail, she set the pace. He did not find it easy to keep up with her her swift silent stride she was so like a ten though lighter and more graceful after a time matt ventured to break the silence you speak good english he said a ten tell me about you she answered you tell him good story a ten didn't tell me he had a sister the girl laughed a ten thinks squaw girl not good for much she said a ten only like to hunt i have a sister too he told her she's coming soon what she name? Sarah. She's younger than you, but Marie isn't an Indian name, is it? Matt asked. It's Christian name. Me baptized by father. A ten had never mentioned a priest either, but Matt knew that the French Jesuits had lived with the Indians here in Maine long before English settlers came. When my sister comes, you will come with a ten to see her, he asked. It might be so, she answered politely. She sounded as though it never would be. At last, they heard the yelping just ahead of them, and they both began to run. Even in his terror, the dog recognized the girl and greeted her with a frantic beating of his tail. He gulped at the meat she held out to him, but she still would not let either of them touch the trap. The girl had come prepared for this, and she unfolded the blanket she had carried, threw it over the dog's head, and gathered the folds behind him. With surprising strength, she held the struggling bundle tightly in her arms, while Matt took the trap in both hands and slowly forced the jaws open. In a moment, the dog was free, escaping the blanket, bounding away from them on three legs, the fourth paw dangling at an on angle. I'm afraid it's broken, Matt said. He was still breathing hard from the last run and from the effort of tugging those steel jaws apart. A ten mend, the girl said, folding up the blanket as calmly as though she were simply tying up, tidying up a cabin. The dog hobbled slowly after them along the trail, lying down now and then to lick at the bleeding paw. They made slow progress, and now that the worry was over, Matt was aware how tired he was. It seemed as though he had been walking back and forth over that trail all day, and the way of the village seemed endless. He was thankful when, halfway to the river, he saw a ten approaching swiftly along the trail. My grandmother send me, he explained. You get dog out? I couldn't do it alone, Matt admitted. A ten stood watching at the dog, came lip, limping toward him. Dog very stupid, he said. No good for hunt. No good for smell turtle smell. What for I take back such foolish dog? His harsh words did not fool Matt for a moment, nor did they fool the dog. The scruffy tail thumped joyfully against the earth. The brown eyes looked up at the Indian boy with adoration. A ten reached into his pouch and brought out a strip of dark, dried meat. Then he bent very gently, took the broken paw into his hands. 
well, what, how, what bravery Matt showed, right? So think about the who, what, why, where, and when. Who was the focus of this chapter? You know, what are the main events that happened? Why is Matt feeling so loyal to a 10? <clears throat> Remind yourself of where this is taking place. And when, like what, remind yourself of what time period we're in, what is the, you know, the when, what is the struggle of the world going on right now between the white men and the Native Americans, <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> and how, how does this chapter tie into the rest of the chapters? How does this fit into the whole book? What is the importance of this to the whole book? Okay, so think about those questions. <clears throat> Go back to the chapter if you need to look for answers. <clears throat> And we will start with chapter 19 next video.